Up next, the CNN special, What Would Jesus Really Do? The war in Iraq, poverty, sex, sin, and AIDS, modern dilemmas challenging the faith. And since we're in the midst of the holy season, we want to know, do American Christians walk the walk or just talk the talk? We're tackling the burning issues with some of the nation's top ministers and asking, what would Jesus really do? If Jesus walked the streets of Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and Houston, what would he really say, and more importantly do, about what he saw? The Bible says faith without works is dead, but conversation without action is just lip service. The Christian agenda isn't the same as the Republican Party platform, and it doesn't exclude Democrats. God's agenda knows no party. But look, as a Christian author and the husband of an ordained Southern Baptist minister, I've grown tired of the unwillingness to broaden the faith beyond a couple of hot button issues. So we decided to put the tough questions to those who proclaim to speak his truths, Rick Warren, T.D. Jakes, Paula White, Jerry Falwell, and others. They speak to millions daily through their growing ministries. Tonight, they speak to you. Joining us now, Bishop T.D. Jakes, pastor of one of the largest churches in America. He's also a best-selling author. He's got a new book coming out. Time Magazine once described him as the next Billy Graham. Also joining us from Florida, Paula White, pastor of one of the largest churches in the U.S., Without Walls International Church. Folks, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Bishop Jakes, I want to start with you. You make it a point not to be involved a lot in politics. We don't see you hanging out at the White House and always saying, I'm endorsing this person. Why? Why do you stay away? Well, you know, I, I like to be involved, but I don't like to be controlled by politics. Uh, when I can float between party lines, I can look after the interests of the people rather than the political party. And for me, that's been a wise decision. I recognize that there are other ministers to approach it differently, but each of us have our own callings, and that's been mine. Now, Pastor White, you uh, same way. I mean, you know, we don't really see you preaching a lot from the pulpit when it, as it relates to politics. Why? Why do you like to stay, in essence, in your pastoral lane? I believe, just as Bishop just said, that it is my assignment and my calling to speak to the heart of men and women and to empower them through the gospel of Jesus Christ, to pray for them. We, we have a lot of folks out there discussing the war in Iraq. How have you related what we, what we are involved in with your members, your congregation? Again, we live uh, next to a military base right here. The church is located by MacDill, and it has been my position to pray for soldiers who go overseas, their families, to minister during, during those times of being separated. But it is not my assignment to legislate or dictate, or but again, to go back to the person meeting their needs, what they are facing in the absence of a father or a mother or some of the life situations that they're dealing with. And so staying effective in our lane of assignment and calling is what I believe we all need to do and do effectively. Bishop, how have you dealt with that? I, I want to level in on that just right. a little bit. First of all, I, pr I prefer peace to war. Uh, anytime we can use diplomacy or some way to avoid the loss of lives, uh, it grieves my heart when I see our sons coming home in body bags, our daughters coming home in body bags, and not only theirs, but, but their Iraqi people and other people who love their children as well. Uh, I serve a Lord who is the Prince of Peace. And I believe that he is a peacemaker. Unfortunately, we live in a world where sometimes war uh, rises up because people will not talk things out. They will not follow the scriptures. They will not follow the principles of the Bible. But whenever possible, if we would live according to the word of God as it really is written to us, if all of us would do it, there would be no war. And Bishop, you just made a point about living according to the principles of the Bible. Let's talk about that when it comes to money. Mm -hmm. A lot of people uh, say that far too many pastors are talking about money. It's all about uh, the gospel of prosperity. Uh, how do you confront that? Because people have said the same thing. They criticize where you live, the house you live in, the cars you drive, the selling of books, things along those lines. What about the issue of prosperity? You, you know, I, I think the thing that a minister has to do is preach a gospel that is balanced. Uh, in my new book, Positioning Yourself, I take some strong stance with this comment about the gospel of prosperity. There is no such thing as a gospel of prosperity. The gospel of
We're celebrating this weekend the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and it has never changed. Uh, so a ministry that focuses totally on prosperity, or for that matter, totally on any th one aspect of the scriptures, does it to the, to the demise of the greater truth of a balanced gospel. There's nothing wrong with a minister prospering if they do it properly, they do it legally, they do it morally. As in my case, I own several businesses, I own several companies, I'm an author in my own rights, and can afford to take care of myself and live my lifestyle. I haven't always had that, but I've always preached the gospel. We shouldn't be preaching for money, but we should not allow money to stop us from preaching. Now, Pastor White, what about that? Because when, when Bishop made the point about uh, what is past, I mean, you know, you, you've gone through a very tough road, uh, a road of transformation. Bishop, when, when he was digging ditches in West Virginia, <laughs> right. uh, dealing with welfare as well, does, does it offend you when a lot people forget that there was a pre Paula White pastor of a large church who went through a whole lot. Well, I know for myself, I never forget. In fact, I believe true empowerment is reaching your hand out with the principles that have transformed you and not just uh, telling a person what they can have to do, but as you have learned how to lead a life of empowerment, how to take the Word of God and use it to transform your life, you reach your hand out and give that person the same principles that changed you. And that, for me, has been the transformation. I know what it is to live in that double wide trailer, to turn the corner, not know what utility is going to be turned off. And it's fundamental that you never forget your history tells a lot about your destiny. I do believe I can reach people effectively because of the journey that I've taken in life. I understand that pain, but I also understand what it is to be able to take those principles and see them applied and work in your life effectively. And I believe that the truest sense prosperity when you ultimately begin to prosper talking in financial mm -hmm. terms is when you begin to affect another person's destiny um, if Jesus was walking the earth today what would be his focus that's a very difficult question probably the most difficult question that you asked me today he said the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me to preach the gospel and I think the priority is to preach the gospel but then he goes on to talk about to bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted you know uh, many times people will label you for a lot of things and, and prosperity was really never my deal my ministry was ministering to hurting people and particularly especially hurting women that's right woman that are loose really was the catalyst of my national ministry and I climbed on the stage not to talk to people about being rich but about being healed from abuse and from trauma and that sort of thing those were some of the things that Jesus did but to preach good news to the poor the acceptable year of the Lord. I think you would be ashamed of the bickering that goes on amongst religious people today, uh, how we build careers out of tearing one another down. And I think that he would be ashamed of the way that we live today with so many things that we have to work with, mm -hmm. not using the communication tools more effectively to communicate a good message and a positive message like we're doing today. Pastor White? Now, I agree with Bishop's mission statement was there to preach the gospel. And I would also say that he declared that he came to save and to seek that which was lost. And it literally means to rescue that which was out of position. Sometimes life will misposition us. We get lost. We are not on the right pathway. And I believe whatever that wrong pathway is, that God through his son Jesus Christ would come put us back on it to experience that wholeness, that freedom, that abundant life, just as I have been so trained transform and experience. In fact, I'm a product of sitting under that gospel preached by Bishop Jakes at Woman Now or Loose that so transformed my life from brokenness, father who committed suicide, sexual and physical abuse, to really be able to stand in front of a mirror and say, I'm okay. From the inside out, God has designed a life for me, and at my core being, I am valuable, I am worthy, and I was not defined by the externals that happened to me, nor the experiences that took place in my life. Okay, here's the toughest question I'm going to ask both of you uh, tonight. Okay. How did Jesus and the Easter Bunny get hooked up on the same weekend? <laughs> Well, I think it speaks to, <laughs> first of all, it's very funny. <laughs> you know, 
I, I think we do so much damage when we start uh, commercializing these sacred events. So, I, you know, the Easter Bunny is a little bit pagan of a concept, though. I, uh, you know, I don't cite people who want to die eggs and do their thing. Some people do. I don't cite them about that. Because in our country, we have so many diversities of ideologies and concepts, and we respect each other. As a Christian, for me, this is a sacred opportunity to remember that our Lord died for our sins that he shed his blood, that he rose from the dead on the third day. And it encourages me as a man of God to understand that Christianity does not hide its face from pain, but it discusses it openly and unashamedly, and it teaches us to resurrect.